Hey, everyone. Welcome to season two of Generative Now. This is the podcast where we talk to the builders who are creating the world's most exciting AI products and companies. I am Michael Magnano. I'm a partner at Lightspeed. And today, we've got Gary Hustwood on the podcast. Gary's a filmmaker known for documentaries like Helvetica and Rams. But his most recent film, Eno, does something pretty different. Eno utilizes a first-of-its-kind generative software system to make sure that no two viewings of the film are the same. Gary and I talked about the future of AI and film, innovating outside of linear narratives, and where the film format goes from here. So check out my conversation with Gary Hustwit. Gary, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Very, very excited to talk to you because I think you are a person that is doing um, probably one of the most interesting things that I've I've heard of in terms of applying AI to a mainstream form of creativity, in this case, film. Uh, and I'm very excited to get into that uh, with you. But but it'd be great maybe before that to to dig a little bit into your background. Um, I was very fortunate enough to see one of your films uh, a while ago, Helvetica, which I thought was incredible and super inspiring. Uh, I'm a designer, so um, definitely meant a lot to me. But um, why don't you tell us a little bit about sort of how you got to where you are right now? Because it's a pretty incredible <laughs> journey. So it's, a, it's a long story, Michael, but um, <laughs> it, it, the, the short version and the long version, I think both start with um, when I was a kid and one of my friends got the first Macintosh, like the week it came out. But um, it was when I first kind of discovered graphic design and, 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 and fonts. I didn't really know what fonts were and I'd never seen the word Helvetica before until I pulled it down on the first Mac dropdown. Um, and that, I think, really kind of um, changed the way I thought. I just really wanted to watch a movie about graphic design and typography. And in 2005, um, when I first had the idea for Hel Helvetica, the, the movie, there was nothing. And so at that point, um, I think a lot of my process is just kind of imagining things and obsessing over them so much that I have to just like, OK, I'll figure out how to do it and just do it myself. And um, and I think it was just at a time when um, fonts and uh, just just uh, graphic design became more of a thing that, that we all did, you know, like like my mom, you know, like had a favorite font and, you know, it was about a personal kind of expression. It was like, oh, I'm a Times New Roman person or I'm, you know, I like this or I like that. You kind of ended up expressing yourself through the font that you chose, and it's really kind of the first time that that happened on a, I think, on a mass uh, level. So, um, yeah, those were probably all factors. There's another reason I think Helvetica was um, was successful, and, and I think it also relates to what I did with with Eno, the, the Brian Eno documentary we just premiered. There's a almost kind of a Where's Waldo kind of thing in Helvetica, where we would go to different cities and we talk to a designer, but then we'd kind of go out in the streets and kind of look for Helvetica in the in the wild. Every shot, the audience was kind of like, "Oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. And where's it? Oh, here it is." Like our brains are very much um, uh, attuned to um, to puzzles and to finding patterns. And, and I think that that movie sort of engaged that that part of our brain. And I think that you know what we did with the with the Eno film is the is, is the same way. The film is different every time you watch it. It's a different mix of scenes, different music, um, and in a way, the audience makes the connections between the different scenes and makes their own kind of version of the story versus having the story sort of like imposed on them. And maybe that's a, a good segue to, to Eno, which obviously takes a very uh, unique approach to, to format. Uh, t tell us about this film. Uh, obviously, like we said at the top, something very, very innovative that I haven't really heard of anyone else doing. So would love to hear about the film and what it was like to work with uh, Brian Eno. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, Brian has been a kind of, you know, creative hero of mine for, for a long time. I, I did a film in um, 2018 about the designer Dieter Rams, the German designer who was the um, direct design director of Braun and huge impact on Apple and the way Apple's devices look and, and work. And um, and I was just kind of like out of the blue. It was like, wow, Brian, you know, it would be amazing to, to do the soundtrack in this movie. And just kind of cold emailed um, his manager and... Um, Brian was also a fan of Dieter Rams. He agreed to do the, the score. It was amazing. He had a great, great time 
uh, working together. Um, but around that time in 2018, when that film came out, you know, I just was kind of thinking, like, why do films have to be the same every time we watch them? Um, because, like, I, I would go out and show my films. I've been making films now for 20 years. I've gone to hundreds and hundreds of screenings. Like, I can't watch my films because I've seen them too much. <laughs> so, like, I start them and I go to a bar and I come back in 80 minutes and we and I do the Q&A or something. Um, it's literally impossible to watch your your the same thing hundreds of times. It's like torture. Um, so my background again is kind of in music, and even if you're a if you're a band with a hit song and you're playing it every night, it's different every night. You can change it. You can extend the section. You can have a guest come up. You can change the lyrics if you want to. Um, and and film doesn't have that. Like I, I wanted film to be more performative, basically. So I was kind of dreaming of ways to to do that and um, and reached out in 2019 to my friend Brendan Dawes, who's incredible British digital artist and um, is somebody who I'd, I'd known through the design world and said, hey, could could this could we do this? Could we make a film that was assembled in software that was different every time it screened? And uh, and that's when we started kind of working on this idea. So right around that time, I thought, well, I just worked with Brian Eno. Brian's kind of famous for using generative technology in his music all the way back to the 90s, the first like very primitive generative music making um, programs that came out in 96 or 97. He, you know, he's always been a pioneer of using technology to kind of enable creativity and think about new ways. So um, I thought who better to, to kind of you know, use a subject for, you know, like a generative film than, than Brian. So, um, I, I had asked him before when we were, when we were working on Rams, I was like, you know, about like, Oh, well, you know, what about making a documentary about your whole career? And he's like, I, I, I hate bio documentaries. I don't want to think about my past. I'm only thinking about the future. Um, you know, I don't want to do it. And, uh, and then when Brendan and I kind of did an early demo of the generative film idea and showed it to Brian, you know, he was just blown away and he was like, I'm in and, you know, let's do this. And then the past few years, we've just been very intense uh, filming things with Brian. He had an incredible archive of 500 hours of visual material, um, everything from like videos that he, almost like home videos, you know, video art things he made when he was living in New York in the 80s or um, studio sessions or lectures in Tokyo in the nineties or whatever. Um, and we, you know, digitized and restored all that stuff, which took a couple of years as well. And then we're also working on the, the software platform that, um, that we'd use to, to make it. So, um, yeah, this idea of like linear static media, um, is just a, a really it's a constraint that goes back to the beginning of of film you know like 130 years ago when it was a physical um medium and that film had to run through cameras and and projectors at 24 frames a second and you had to be able to duplicate them so of course you had a master and you would make copies of it of course it had to be all the same um but with like generations of audiences have just kind of kind of accepted that that constraint like oh yes <laughs> the film's going to start here it's it's gonna end here it's always going to be yeah it's always going to be it is. it's like we were so dazzled by the moving image that we were like didn't really question like oh well does it have to be the same every time right um and obviously when when film went kind of digital in the you know the 90s and and uh in 2000s that constraint is gone but we all we've done is just do the same thing and that's it there's been no innovation on the formal side and i think there's just so many possibilities that you know film was just kind of a um you know an opening to this conversation like okay here's an idea we premiered the film at, at sundance um a few weeks ago and um and people were blown away it's pretty it's a pretty simple idea i think um you know just make a movie that's different every time um and but that took a lot of both programming uh, work, but it also took a lot of kind of storytelling and filmmaking work. But uh, there's there's so many kind of ideas I think in in that movie, um, both Brian's ideas, which are amazing on one level, but just the idea of like 
can we think of film as this changing, evolving storytelling structure and not just as this static linear piece of media? Now, is it is it deterministic in that like it'll always tell the same basic story? You just might see slightly different footage to get there or or is is the story actually impacted by the generative feature? Yes and yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> why the film works is that's one of the, the reasons it's all it's all it's all, it's all Brian. Um, we have kind of the same start of the movie and the same kind of ending scene in the movie. And then kind of what happens in between, you know, I think we established very early on that you could be anywhere the next scene. You could be in 1973 with Roxy Music. You could be in 2023. You could be anywhere in between scene to scene. Um, and, and again, the audience sort of makes the connections. Um, what the system does is sort of intelligently like arrange that each time, hmm. creates transitions between these different scenes that that, you know, have been selected for that version of the film. Um, and then also kind of um, creates pure generative scenes um, using our raw material. Uh, and those are created dynamically for, for that are unique to each cut. So it tells its own story, basically. So these it, scenes, I mean, it basically writes them. Yeah, but we've also edited them in a way that they can appear or not appear, or right. when they appear, depending on where they appear, they still kind of do a job. They 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 yeah. they're giving you some sort of um, information or sort of story beats that 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 uh, again kind of fulfill what we as film watchers think is like a you know an engaging narrative arc even though the arc changes every time. It's interesting, like, just seeing the, you know, we showed there were six screenings at Sundance, so all six unique versions. Like, every time we show the film, it's a completely different film. You'll never see the same version twice. Um, but uh, some of them are, are, they have a different vibe. Some of them are, like, really energetic and lots of music, and hmm. some of them are a little bit more introspective and a little bit about Brian's interior life or uh, more a deep dive into his ideas. And, and then, you know, some of them are, are a mix of those things. So I think it's it's fun. And again, that, that, that idea of um, we're always looking for patterns and trying to kind of connect the dots to a story, like you get to do that in so many different ways with with this film, and that idea that it's it's unique it's a unique experience. Like every time we show the film, it is only for the people in this room. You're the only ones in the world who are going to experience this with us. So it, it turns it into more a, of an event than just like I'm going to watch the same thing everyone else has seen. Right. So in in addition to the footage that you're feeding the system are there other parameters that you feed the engine to kind of maintain the integrity of the narrative arc or is it really just hey we're gonna we're gonna have the same beginning the same ending and the ai is gonna figure out everything else no there's there's definitely like um um you can look at each kind of scene as a as a type um whether it's about the creative process it's a it's a, just a music pure music thing it's a a, a big idea about, you know, Brian talks about AI and generative in, in tech in the movie, um, along with a lot of other things. Um, or is it just a kind of a, 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 per, a history, personal history thing? Or, um, you can kind of establish a, a rhythm with of those scenes, of those types of scenes and how those come out. You don't, aren't going to have four big ideas in a row. You want to kind of have, a, a again, establish a, a, a rhythm. So that's part of of it um obviously there's a ton of metadata on you know every every piece of media whether it's uh, an edited scene or it's just raw material in the system and you know the the kind of rules and and ways we programmed it are, are again with our knowledge as filmmakers about you know what what kind of what works <laughs> um and Again, it, it, for whatever reason, it, it works. I mean, there were early early outputs that that did not work, but through you know trial and error and and um, and training the system and and um, and also adjusting the way that we edit uh, the scenes mm. and and even the type of material that we put in. So you put all the stuff together, and really doesn't matter what order or what things you get or don't get. Um, 
I think it's all it's all interesting. And then the the software also has some presence. I mean, we we, we thought that um, I don't know, it's just like a kind of like a, it's like a magic trick or something. Like if you don't know that something is happening that's different, you you know, you just wouldn't even notice it. And I think that that we definitely kind of let the code kind of come through uh, in in the film when there are decisions being made. You know, you, you'll kind of see the system scrubbing through, yeah, scrubbing through file names, looking at deciding, making that decision. I mean, really, it's made that decision in a thousandth of a second, you know, at the beginning of the process. But we still let it kind of visualize um, that or scrubbing through, you know, frames of, of video and like these bursts of, of footage that kind of come through in, in different areas. So um, there there is a... a uh, a, the, a visual, it's part of the visual language of the movie a little bit is this, is, is the code. Tell us about the software. Like how, how, how was that made? What, what went into it? Were you a part of that process or is that, was that your partner that you mentioned? Yeah. Brendan is really the, 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 the mind behind a lot of that. I'm the guy who's like, yeah, good. Yeah, that's cool. Could we make it do <laughs> this maybe? And then Brendan's like, yeah, you know, he's from Liverpool. So he talks like this. He's like, yeah, we could do that. And he goes off and we, then we kind of like work, um, you know, keep, keep playing around with the thing. It's, it's like Brendan is, is just a, a, a genius at code, but he's also just like a, I mean, he's, he's an artist. He's not a, just a core coder. He's like, his whole thing is like data, um, you know, using data to make visualizations or, you know, physical or, or, um, digital, you know, art. And, and also that it, it, it's just, you need to have a kind of poetry and, and code. Um, so that's how we approach this. I mean, he's just a, a film lover as I am. Um, and, and also just a fan of, of, of Eno. So, you know, we approached it with, um, you know, trying to kind of make something that was true to what Brian was about. And like a, a structure that was like organic to the way Brian worked, so that was really what um, what drove us on the on the coding. It, it also, it was like you know, you know, Brian has these oblique strategies cards, which are these like creative prompts. Like if you're hmm. stuck and I don't know, like you could pull a card and it's like you know, try it in reverse or whatever. But um, <laughs> we did use some of those ideas both in the in the programming because. Um, well, you'll 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 see when you when you see the okay. film. <laughs> At certain points, like like Laurie Anderson or David Byrne, might just kind of appear on on screen and, and pull one of these cards, and then what? Depending on what card comes up, that then skews the film in, a, in the rest of the film in a different direction. Oh wow! Um, so there were a lot of kind of things like again, build, trying to build Brian's ideas into into it, it too, but. Um, but yeah, it, 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 a lot of it was just like kind of Brendan and I bouncing bouncing ideas back and forth, and working with the chip material, and then working with our editors, uh, Marley McDonald and Maya Tippett, on kind of um, editing the work and formatting the work so that the kind of the generative engine could could kind of work with it in the in the best way. So I, I think I read that since the premiere, you've you've added even more footage. Uh, yeah. How, how does that work? Does that expand the length, or is, does it just no, change what the output's going to be? It changes the the um, the the possible variations. Basically, Got it. it just Got adds it. more. Um, we just continue adding more to the to the pool. Right. Um, so yeah, we've added dozens of of scenes and and more and more raw footage to it um, since since Sundance. So every generation of the film will be will be different as we keep modifying the, the software, but also since we, we keep adding more, uh, more material to it. And, and you mentioned you have editors and obviously, you know, you were, you were guiding, uh, your partner, uh, throughout the, the software development, but does it work such that like, once the software is written, it's kind of baked. And at that point, the role of the human editor changes, or does there have to be this sort of this tight um, yeah. partnership between the software and the human editor. Yeah, I think for, for this, at, at this stage and in, in kind of, you know, experimenting with, with these kind of um, structures, th there has to be like a, a back and forth. Okay. Um, because we'll, we'll, we'll say, oh, kind of, hmm, maybe each scene does need a little bit of a bumper on, on the end, a little bit of like a landing pad. You don't want to start something with someone talking right away because, you know, um, you're thinking about how the, puzzle pieces are going to fit together and then kind of a um 
watching watching outputs watching yep. outputs watching outputs and this isn't working what can we do how can we change that you know is it a programming thing or is it an editing thing um i think that you know as we've seen there's some incredible uh you know tools coming out and, and uh with with uh, ai generated video and and all these other things but you still need to be able to tell a story like i can make a technical tool you know I mean the 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 team that made Sora, it's incredible. It's like amazing, like amazing step. But they're they're kind of really even kind of not sure how the the artists are going to use it. They're going to kind of put it out there, and then people will figure out what the tool is 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 for. So um, you still need that whatever the tool is. You still need that um, you know the ideas and and the storytelling and 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 to be able to kind of like make something that really connects and and has a soul. So. Um, it, as cool as the the I think that the 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 tech is it, it is also really about the 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 human part of it too. There's got to be that 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 balance. Yeah, for sure. Definitely want to get into Sora, so I'm I'm glad you brought it up. But uh, but before we do that, you know, we t we talked a little bit about um, streaming earlier and sort of streaming as being the kind of delivery mechanism for films like Helvetica and basically every every film that we watch today. Um, you know, it strikes me that this film can't be delivered <laughs> that yeah. way. And so maybe two part question. Number one, how, how, how do you watch this film technically? Like how is it actually being projected or displayed? And then how, what will need to change for a film like this to be consumed by the masses at home, you know, on my smart TV um, yeah. or on my, you know, my Apple TV or something. Yeah. Well, um, for the live events, which I'm, I'm super excited about, for those, we're creating the film live on stage in, in real time. Like we're making it for that that audience, um, which is going to be really fun, which is actually a lot easier to do than have the system render out a perfect file with 5.1 audio and no glitches. That's actually harder. <laughs> um, we can do that. We can just render out a video and we make make a a, a DCP. It's you know di digital cinema package. It's what how movies show um, how theaters show films. Um, we can do that, or we can do it live, which is is actually much more much more fun too, um, because it, it makes it a little bit more of an event or a performance than just like another film screening. So the the live screenings that's one thing. Um, streaming it, it is like, you know, the, 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 I think the highest use is everybody who streams the film gets a unique version that only they get. Cause we can, there's like billions of possible, ver, ver, you know, versions of the film that can come out of our, our platform. Um, that would be the, I think that the, the dream, the current streaming, you know, the, the, the big streamers are, are nowhere near that, uh, capability right now. You know, something I, I was talking to, I'm not going to name the streamers, but uh, I was like, well, I could just, we could just give you 365 versions of the film and every night at midnight, you just push a new file and the film's different every day. No, can't, we can't do that. That's impossible. Even but that. Interesting. Even that. I think that the best they even were thinking was like they could maybe do it a different version every month. But even that with hundreds of different territories, that was going to be a huge lift. So that's the level of, I think, technical, um, you know, innovation we're, we're, we're at, uh, which I think is going to be, um, you know, they're going to be completely disrupted by what's what's coming. And, and I think they don't even maybe realize it or are just starting to realize it with things like Sora. But like a native AI streaming platform is something that will happen where all the content is dynamically created, where viewer preferences actually get baked into the creation of the films or the series. Um, I think there's just so many huge, you know, possibilities that you could do with, with the technology and, and really they're, they're, they're using it for the, for the other side of it, just to kind of like right. recommend you more of their sort of linear, you know, true crime series or whatever. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, if you think of um, what we were talking about earlier, when we talked about the business model uh, of Netflix early on, and then compared to now, there is a cost to the content, right? There's a cost that, that, that they incur when they um, 
I guess it used to be when they would stream a piece of content, but now it's when they acquire or produce a piece of content. And I think per your point, there's probably a world in which that cost goes away and the creation of each additional piece of content is completely marginal when it's generated on the fly. Um, but the flip side of that, you know, almost sounds a little, a little scary, right? And it sort of contrasts with what we talked about earlier, how the human uh, is the person that sort of, or, you know, is the thing that's driving the story and the creativity. In, in, in this world we talk about, it almost sounds like the human would be <laughs> removed from that and the, and the platform would just be leveraging AI as much as possible to optimize uh, the model and the cost. I mean, is, is, that a, is that a potential sort of bad outcome here? Or, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about the platforms and their incentives, you know? Oh, yeah. And their inc incentives are definitely about um, you know, cost reduction. Um, I think that there's a world where, you know, I think one of the possibilities with, with the Eno platform and, you know, which is using real video, um, but it's the way that it's presented, the formal experimentation and that the kind of, that can be, um, I think a way that, you know, even with with Sora, even with AI generated, you know, video, traditional filmmaking is not going to go away. There are still going to be filmmakers making things. You can't make Twenty Days in Mariupol or you know a documentary like that um, in AI. There's still going to be lots of of film being made. Um, but the idea of, of this sort of hybrid using kind of traditionally shot film, but using it in ways that are um, you know informed by AI and other tech, I think, is is sort of a middle ground to pure, you know, AI generated um, things. E even if you if you have pure AI generated content, I think it's still going to have to have some sort of human story interaction uh, to make it compelling. And also, I think it depends on what kind of 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 content we're talking about. You know, we're talking about feature films. We're talking about Marvel Marvel movies. We're talking about um, kids animation, you know, um, are we talking about kind of more like industrial kind of films like, you know, uh, Synthesia or, you know, uh, that sort of stuff that, that I think those things are going to are, are obviously completely um, changing and, and will will be a huge shift in kind of the people and and equipment you need to make that stuff. Um, but um yeah, I think it's 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 all fascinating and 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 like I'm I'm excited about the possibilities. I'm I'm always thinking about like well, what do the new tools? What are the capabilities that that they um that they make possible? It's not for me it's not about oh, I can do this cheaper and quicker now. I I I'm thinking about okay, well what can I dream of now that that with this new tool that I couldn't do before? Like what what does it unlock creatively for me as a as a filmmaker? Um, so I, I think that you either kind of embrace the tools and, and look at them in that way or, or, or you don't. You mentioned Sora earlier, uh, you know, just to, just to recap, OpenAI last week announced a new video model called Sora, where they enable anyone uh, with access to this tool, which is not available yet publicly, I should mention, uh, generate any any video via text to video prompt. I think the limit they've talked about is up to 60 seconds, but have to imagine that's going to go up and have to imagine it's you know also going to be possible for people to string these things together. What do you think, you know, the nearest term impact of that on on filmmaking? Do you think we will see more filmmakers a, as a result or do you, or do you expect traditional filmmakers to start leveraging this to augment their creative workflow? You just mentioned when something new comes out, you, your question is, "Hey, how do I use this to do something I haven't done before?" Is that what we're going to see for more traditional filmmakers? Um, I, I, I think I think so. I think for, for some filmmakers that are open to that experimentation, definitely. I think there are going to be some that are, are purists. You know, are we going to see a ton of AI in the next, you know, final Quentin Tarantino film? Like, I, I, probably not. Um, but, but yeah, like any technology that, like, makes uh, the medium more accessible and lowers the bar to entry, we're going to see a ton of new voices. Are we going to see just a flood of, of this stuff to the point that any online video that we watched, we just have to assume is synthetic? Um, maybe, because I think that like nobody expected, you know, Sora level quality this quickly, and it's really their first pass. 
I mean, in, in a year or two years, this is just going to be just indistinguishable, I feel. Um, so when that happens, you know, how does that impact just anything that you watch online? People are, you know, it's, it's beyond like deep fakes and, you know, people are like all sort of um, anxious about, oh, it's an election year. We're going to see all kinds of like, you know, fake uh, video content with tools like this. Um, I, I think there's a bigger question about authenticity here and a bigger question about um, do you know at, at trust basically? Um, so it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm excited to try the tools. I'm excited to uh, again innovate with kind of some of the formal structural uh, possibilities using traditional video too. I still think enabling creativity, even though a lot of people would say, well, it's really taking away from creativity, and you know, it's it's this shortcut that now you're not kind of learning all these other like parts of the the craft and and all this stuff. But um, I think that's ends up being true with with any technological advancement that we've seen over the past hundred years. Yeah, it feels like, you know, the conversation uh, among sort of the entertainment industry, film, Hollywood, you know, thinking a lot about the writer strike from a few months yeah. ago. It has yeah. been it has been uh, a tone, I think, of of, of, of fearfulness about totally. the future. You, you sound a bit more, I would say, optimistic or, or pragmatic, I would say. Um, is that, is that a, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, you think you're, you're a little more optimistic about how people will balance this? I, 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 I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic just because I, I think that the possibilities to, in ways to tell stories is going to exponentially increase, um, from not just things like Sora, but just like, again, more kind of thinking around, um, how this can change cinematic storytelling. So, so let's talk about Anamorph. That's probably a great segue. So basically the techniques that you uh, leveraged for Eno, it sounds like you, you and your partner are now turning this into a service or a product. Tell us, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Well, I mean, it, it partly, <laughs> again, because the experience at Sundance with, um, I think the rest of the industry being kind of unprepared for, for what, we, uh, what we put out. Um, I think that we want to innovate in ways to stream films like this uh, and ways to kind of integrate kind of AI into streaming, into story, story structure, um, into live events. I mean, there are so many different things that, that we could do right now, even with this kind of very kind of basic platform that we, we created for Eno. I mean, give me like uh, 2001 and let me dig around in Kubrick's boxes and find get, get all the alt alternate takes and all the music and all the dialogue and everything and let me put that into a generative platform and I could create like this incredible ever evolving um you know 2001 like film world that you could just kind of like walk into we could make it a physical exhibit like you know um there are so many different ways I think to use this technology that um that we can explore, and that was one of the reasons that Brendan and I wanted to launch Animorph, was to to just to do that, to work with studios, work with streamers, you know, partner with other um, you know AI companies to do uh, to experiment with this stuff to explore, um, because I think there's so much potential that that is still um, not like being being realized, uh, you know. So so that's that's what we've been doing. We we got a lot of. I think um, really interesting approaches after Sundance by film studios and producers and others to be like, hey, well, we've got this idea. Oh, also like ad agencies too. Hmm. There's a lot of that like, oh, we want to make our brand film, but we want to make it, you know, it's a 30 second thing. We want it to be different every time. We want to be able to do unlimited versions of this this idea or, or customize them. Um, so there are a lot of ways, I think, to innovate on that side, on the formal side. And we've got millions of hours of existing films that I think could be sort of generatively remixed. So that's definitely what we want to explore, just like what are the creative possibilities of this, but also how do we kind of like get streaming and get the kind of delivery side of this up to the spec where we could actually like do that. Synchronous, dynamically created content streams to tens of thousands or whatever, how many people 
um, where they're everyone's getting their own version of the content. Yeah, so that was that was that was actually my next question. So there's obviously a, cre a, a creative side to this. Is then there also a consumption side? Will you you know will this be its own platform that maybe you know I can visit on my on my computer or my my smart TV to to consume this content? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're so early stage. I mean, we haven't, yeah. <laughs> as of this podcast, we haven't even publicly launched and, you know, we're doing our initial seed round. I mean, okay. um, so, the, you know, we'll spend the first, you know, six months to a year figuring out what the product market fit is. And again, just, just meeting and collaborating. We're already collaborating with, with um, fil other filmmakers. Uh, a big part of this is like, I, I want other filmmakers to like, you know, do this idea. What would like, I don't know, Jonathan Glazer or someone like, like, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, just baking that idea that the story could be different every time, or just the kind of these capabilities into a film from the, from the very beginning of the project. So, um, those kind of collaborations are, are what we're excited about. Um, building out the kind of like tech side, you know, we'll see, maybe it'll, it'll be in partnership with a streamer or we'll, we'll, we'll try doing something on our own. We can definitely do something on our, on our own, whether that has the kind of critical mass to kind of like get the idea out there, um, you know, remains to be seen. So uh, I think it's, it's, again, we're just kind of open to, to collaborating and exploring and seeing where this idea um, can go and, um, and, and how it ends up kind of being delivered and, and, you know, I mean, this is a bigger question, I think, for the whole industry and not just our little startup. Yeah, for sure. So obviously you're 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 promoting, Eno right now. So you're, um, maybe you're not even thinking about your your next uh, film. But w will you do this again? Is this basically the roadmap mm. for all your future works? Um, I, I don't know, <laughs> but um, it's definitely something that I'm looking at ideas for films that I had previously in, in a different light now. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I definitely want to explore, I, I, I don't know, I probably have 50 or 60 films that I would love to make that haven't been made yet, um, that I want to see made. Um, and you know, we, we joked about the generative version of Helvetica or whatever. Yeah. Um, there, there are definitely things like that where I think you could recontextualize existing films generatively and that would be really cool, cool experiments. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love the process of filmmaking. It's a lot of work. I mean, the hmm. Eno project was five years. Most of my films have been between two and five years each. So um, a lot goes into it. I, I'm, I'm really excited about exploring the, 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 the platform, the, the, the tools that we've created and seeing what those possibilities are too. So I have not yet planned my next film. I mean, right now it's really just like, we're gonna be doing these live screenings all around the world of Eno and also kind of just developing the, the tech with Animorph and, and, um, and kind of, again, engaging in these conversations. And, and um, then I'll think about what, <laughs> what the next film will be or, or if, I'll, if I'll do another film. Awesome. So where can people learn more about the film? How can we see it? Uh, I, would, I would love to see it. So I can't wait till it's in New York or you know, somewhere yeah. near me. Yeah. Well, the first wave is like um, there are other other film festivals, but also just like um, kind of one night only public screening events that are going to happen cool. in like 50 major cities around the world. So that'll be the kind of first wave to see it this spring. Um, and then, again, part of this is like building the technology for it to to be able to to stream or to have a, a home video version of it somehow. I think that, um, you know. Most of the the streamers that that I talked to at Sundance were like, well, you could do just like a director's cut, just like one version of it, right? Yeah. Then we could release that. That that's like the least interesting way, yeah. um, you know. And, and I'm hoping it doesn't come to that. I, I, I want to be able to do something where you know it's uh, uh, it's different every time, and we could release it as an app. I mean, there's a lot of other kind of ideas floating around, but um, these. Big wave of public screenings first, and then we'll figure out how we do kind of more of a wider theatrical release because we can do that. There's a ton of interest to do it, um, you know, in in regular cinemas too. 
Um, and then, um, you know, I, I'd say like, you know, by the fall, we'll have uh, the digital strategy worked out and hopefully have some really interesting new possibilities that come up with um, with Animorph. So it, people can go to, to my website, um, hustwit.com, and there's a, you know, screenings page. You can get on the mailing list to, to be notified of that. And of course, when we end up doing the streaming. And then um, animorph.com is the um, the our, our new startup. And, um, you know, I think we're hoping to do a lot of exciting things with it. Awesome. Gary, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for the time. <laughs> Can't wait to see Eno and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Michael. Thanks for listening to Generative Now. If you liked what you heard, please do us a favor and rate and review the podcast. This really does help. And if you want to learn more, follow Lightspeed at Lightspeed VP on YouTube, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Generative Now is produced by Lightspeed in partnership with Pod People. I am Michael Magnano, and we will be back next week. See you then. <laughs>